I'm grateful that you are here with us for week five of our series, Power to Change. We want to welcome those who are joining us online. Can we give it up for uh, people around the world, people at the Kaufman Detention Center? We're grateful that you're here uh, and joining us for uh, this series. And um, today we're going to just add another layer to what we've been discussing over the last several weeks. Uh, I'm going to start with the confession today. Um, I am fairly competitive. Uh, I think that's important to say. And the reason is because I feel like I cover it pretty well, generally speaking. Uh, but I find that um, winning is more fun than losing. Can I get an amen from anybody uh, in the room? And so like I enjoy winning. Uh, if I'm playing a game with my family, one of two things is true. Either I win or the game is stupid. Uh, so that's something I've discovered to be true about myself. Uh, and I also am um, inspired when someone tells me there's something I can't do. And typically, uh, my response is we have pig valves in human hearts and people living in space. I think it's possible to accomplish whatever it is you're telling me is not possible. And then I go to work to get it done because I would prefer to win. And I think a lot of us would prefer uh, to win. So just out of curiosity, let's take a quick poll. Um, how many of you love to win and hate to lose? Okay, that's a lot of people. Uh, and the ones that didn't raise your hands, you're probably judging us right now. And the reason you're judging us is because somewhere along the way, you've decided uh, that it is better to just kind of uh, set yourself aside and let other people win and give your kids a victory and let them cheat at a game and win anyway. No, you shouldn't do that, right? Uh, there's something about winning, and I can back it up biblically. First Corinthians 9.24 says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to what? Get the prize. We can translate that this way. Run in such a way as to what? Win. We want to be winners, and we want to live a victorious life. It reminds me of what the great theologian Ricky Bobby once said. Uh, if you ain't first, you're last. And so we want to be winners. We want to ask the question today, uh, what is it that keeps us from living the victorious life that God has designed for us to live? Uh, and again, just as a shout out, we have learned so much from uh, Pastor Craig Rochelle's book, Power to Change. Uh, and we want to give him credit for um, lots of these thoughts because it's helped all of us grow uh, and we hope that it is beneficial for you as well. But what we notice is Paul, whenever he says, run in such a way as to get the prize, he didn't say race to finish. He didn't say uh, race for fun. Uh, he didn't say race uh, to get a participation trophy. Don't get me started on that. I think that's ruined our society. Uh, instead, what did he say? He said, I want you to run to win. And then what Paul does is he, he connects this to the way we live our lives. If you want, if I want, he's saying, if we want to have a victorious life, we're going to have to run to win. Uh, we are called to a purpose-driven victorious life, which is problematic for so many of us at different times uh, in our lives, because even though we believe that that's what God has said is true of us, that we're, so, we're um, designed to live with a purpose and to win, uh, there are lots of areas in our lives uh, where we don't feel like we're um, going to ever get the breakthrough. It just feels like it, it won't budge and we're stuck in some kind of cycle that we can't get out of. Uh, some of you are losing ground in your finances. Some of you are struggling in your relationships. Uh, it feels like Satan has your number when it comes to temptation. Uh, your mental health is not good because of anxiety um, or depression. You feel like you're losing the battle uh, in your mind. And so the question is, if we were in fact designed by God, and then for those of us who are in Christ Jesus that have been rescued out of our sin and have the great hope of eternal life in front of us, then why are we not living a victorious life? Why are we not Winning, And so today what we're going to do is I'm going to um, propose to you that the reason is because we've been trying for too long. We've been trying to have a victorious life, uh, trying to do different things. So some of you would say, well, I'm, I'm going to try to start praying more. And you do. And you go home this afternoon and, and you get in whatever posture you have and you say, oh, sweet baby Jesus. And you try to say something and then you run out of stuff to say. And in a day or two later, you find that you're not praying consistently 
anymore. Others of you maybe say, I'm going to try to be more patient with my kids. And so you're in a conversation with your kids and they do that thing, say that thing, don't do that thing, whatever it is that causes you to kind of amp up in your spirit. So you grit your teeth and you're like, I'm trying to be more patient with, you know, whenever you talk through your teeth, I'm trying to be more patient with you, but you are working my last nerve, right? But you're trying, you're trying to keep yourself uh, patient with your kids. Uh, A lot of people are going to try to stop procrastinating. And here's what I know about all the procrastinators who want to stop. You're going to start stopping tomorrow, right? Uh, Because you're trying uh, to stop. You're trying to eat better. Preaching to myself now. I get it. It's a struggle. We're moving into the holidays. And I've got some people in my neighborhood who love to bake, and they know that I love to eat. And that combination is not ever really very good. And so what's going to have to happen over the course is I'm going to have this mindset of I'm going to try really hard to eat better. And then whenever they bring food, I'm, I know what my flesh is going to say. It's going to say, well, it would be rude not to eat it, right? Because they work so hard. And so I'm going to try to eat better. I'm going to try to go to bed at a decent time. But what happens? You start watching something on uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix or Hulu or what? There's like a thousand of them, right? And you start watching it and, and then it's that little thing pops up that says next episode. And what do you do? You're like, it's two o'clock in the morning. I got to go to, oh, I got to see what happens. And you just kind of keep going. So you're going to try to get to bed at a decent time. Try to cut down on screen, screen time. Try to get better with your money. The problem for so many of us is we have been trying for so long. And today, um, what we're going to learn from the scripture is we need to have a perspective shift. Right? We've got to think differently um, about uh, these things that we're trying to overcome, these things that we're trying to change. Remember, uh, the, the whole point of this series isn't really about the change. It's about the power that we realize that in Christ Jesus, that we have the power to do all things that he's created us to do. And he has created us and saved us so that we could walk in a victorious life. And we've got to get to the place where we stop trying for that, and instead we're able to embrace it. Let's do a quick review, because all these weeks have built off of one another. Week one, we talked about how um, behavior modification is not going to be sufficient for the change that we want. Because if we're talking about the the power of God given to us through the Spirit of God, uh, then we've got to recognize that this is a spiritual issue. The hurts and the habits and the hangups that we have in in, in our lives are really connected to who we are spiritually, And so just gritting our teeth and white knuckling our way through some change isn't going to prove to be long lasting. However, if we recognize that it's a heart issue, therefore a spiritual issue, and we come up with the spiritual why, like why is it that we want to change? Is it connected to something eternal? If we can get to that place, then then suddenly we're going to be able to tap into the power that God has given us through his spirit to be able to change. So the first week we talked about the why, do we have a spiritual why? The second week we talked about the spiritual who. And if you were with us, you'll remember we talked about how Satan loves to mess with our identity, and and he likes to convince us that we are the sum total of all of our mistakes. So whatever your most embarrassing thing has been, whatever your biggest mistake in life has been, what the enemy wants to convince you of and what the enemy wants to convince me of is that's not just something we did, it's who we are. And once we start to believe that that's who we are, uh, then we start to kind of live out of that ideology. We start to live out of that mindset that this is just the way it's always going to be. This is what I've always done. It's just what I'm always going to do. I'm destined to stay this way. But we also talked about from the word of God, if we could see ourselves the way God sees us, it would change everything. So not only do we need a spiritual why, but we've got to have a spiritual who. Uh, Who did God create me to be? I've got to answer that question. What's the unique divine purpose that God has given me? You've got to answer that question for yourself. But you got to get a handle on the spiritual who. And then week three, we talked about a spiritual what. Where, where is it that we're like, what, what are we trying to accomplish? And uh, what is one habit that we need to add to our lives that's going to help us get to this place of change that God wants us to get to? Uh, and so we ask you to consider what's one habit that you needed to insert into your life and to not underestimate the power of one holy habit. And then week four, we talked about what's something that you need to get rid of. What's a what not? This is something I shouldn't do anymore. It it seems like a small thing, but it's holding us back from walking in the victory that God has for us through Jesus. Like, what's the thing we need to get rid of? And so today, uh, we're going to talk about the spiritual how. 
How are we going to do it? And again, this is a perspective shift because we talk a lot about trying, but here's, here's the, the, the meat of the sermon in terms of just a, a simple thought to get your head around. We have to stop trying and we have to start training. And there's a difference in those two things. We've got to stop trying to change and we've got to tap into the power and we've got to train toward change. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, the verse that I mentioned at the top of the message, was part of Paul's letter to the uh, church at Corinth. And I just want to show you on a map uh, where Corinth is because it's about 50 miles away from Athens. Uh, and this is where the Olympic Games originated, took place every four years. In addition to that, uh, there was another um, gaming type thing that, that would happen every two to three years in a town that was close by. And they had chariot racing, they had running, they had wrestling, they had poetry. Uh, and I've kind of run that through my head. I'm not athletic, and so uh, I would probably, probably be in the poetry division. And I just imagine what it would be like to be, you know, every, all the people showing up to compete in these sports. Like, hey, what are you here for? I'm here for wrestling. I'm here for chariot racing. I'm here for running. What are you here for? I'm writing poems. Like, I, I just feel like it wouldn't be quite as uh, glamorous as some of the others. But these games were a huge part of their lives. These games were a huge part of their culture. And so this is the context in which Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Now, this metaphor that Paul uses is fairly straightforward, and you can read through it and understand what it's communicating, but I want to pick it apart just a little bit today. Um, basically, Paul was saying, hey, you all are well aware of the Isthmian Games. You, you know uh, that this is something that happens uh, on a recurring basis. You know uh, what all goes into it. You know that the runners are giving everything that they have. Uh, you know that the wrestlers are giving everything that they have. Like, you know these things to be true. And then he kind of turns their mind a little bit by saying this. I, I can just see him clapping and say, hey, guys, listen. You know how hard they train to win these games that are temporary. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we should be even more committed to training ourselves up in holiness and in godliness and in righteousness so that we can live the life of victory that God wants us to live. We've got to give everything that we have to attain that victorious life that God has for us. And so uh, they would have been well aware of all the strict training that these athletes would have gone through. Uh, you can compare it to today's Olympic athlete. I've heard uh, stories of all the things that Olympic athletes go through, and I'm like, that's one more reason why I'm probably never going to be an Olympic athlete. There are other reasons. But, but, I mean, it's a lot of training, right? And so history reveals um, that their entire life would start to revolve around this training to be prepared for these games. Uh, history tells us that they would go in 10 months prior uh, at a minimum to begin the really, really intense training program. They would eat a very strict diet. Uh, so there were no junk food. So a lot of us are out on that, right? Uh, there was no wine. You couldn't drink wine. So a lot of y'all out on that one too. Uh, we'll pray for y'all. So anyway, like there's, there's a lot, right? So there were things that they were like, this is not good for my body. And so I'm, I'm going to abstain from consuming it so that I can be in the very best shape that I could possibly be. And the wrestlers would train in the hottest part of the summer and the coldest part of the winter uh, outside so that they would make sure that they were able to train in the harshest of elements to prepare themselves. Uh, some of them, the wrestlers would train by wrestling bulls and um, horses, and some uh, record that they even wrestled lions in, <laughs> in a, order to be prepared for these games. And at that point, I'm going, I am so happy to be part of the poetry division. I really am, <laughs> right? Because that's scary stuff right there. Um, but they would train really, really hard. Uh, runners would run in the nude. There wasn't anything sexual about that. They just didn't want anything hindering them from being able uh, to run uh, with all of their might. The runners in the games, listen to me, were not hoping. They were not trying. Uh, they were training to win. There's a difference between trying and training. 
And what we believe, and, and Pastor Craig has helped us to see this, and, and once, once you start viewing it, you're going to see it too, that a whole lot of, everybody look at me, Christianity is busy trying, and it feels like a lot less of Christianity is busy training for the good work that is ahead of us. So we've got to stop hoping for a victorious Christian life. Uh, we've got to stop um, trying to live a victorious Christian life. And we've got to start training ourselves to live in the victory that Christ has already accomplished for us. Look at what Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. It says, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So Paul says that physical training is of some value. And I'm grateful to hear that. Um, those of you who have known me a long time, you know that I have publicly struggled with my weight. I've made lots of commitments over the years that I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to try, right? You've heard me say that I'm going to try. And this series has been helpful because I've, I've stopped trying and I've started actually training. More on that in a, in a minute. Uh, but what I've noticed is that this physical training, Paul's exactly right. It produces good things in other parts of your life. I've been more committed uh, to going to the gym. And so um, I go five days a week and I, I work it into my schedule. I have for years, uh, first of all, I've never been one of those people that like, oh, I feel so great after I leave the gym. I've never felt great after I left the gym. <laughs> Uh, never. And, and so there have been people who say, well, one day it'll happen. I'm like, I don't, I don't think so. This is, this is not part of my wiring and more on that later. But what I've realized is that um, I need to go. And, and so because I, didn't, I don't get the high that other people seem to get from going to a gym, I've had to just say, look, this is a non-negotiable thing. And I'm not doing it because I enjoy it. I'm doing it because it's better for me. Like, I need to do this. I've got, to, I've got to solidify this and not just try. I've got to make a commitment, and I've got to do the hard uh, work. So um, because of that, I go to bed earlier because I'm getting up earlier. Uh, and whenever I get up earlier, I realize uh, that I'm being more productive, not just uh, throughout the day, which that's true also. Um, I'm being more productive. Um, but I'm really productive first thing in the morning. That's when my mind is the sharpest. And I don't think I knew that until I started creating these disciplines uh, to go, wow, I'm really at my best earlier in the morning. Uh, there's no distractions, and uh, I haven't started getting text messages from people and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's been beneficial. Um, getting up earlier, like this last Saturday, I got up. I don't know why I woke up at 5.15 on a Saturday. Oh, actually, I do know why I woke up at 5.15, because I'm retraining myself uh, to go to bed earlier so that I can get up and do things that I need to do. And so my family gets up and the garage is completely clean. My wife come, came out and she's like, hey, I'm ready to help. I'm like, it's, it's nine o'clock, I'm, I'm done. And it was, it was amazing, right? She's like, well, that's awesome. Everything looks, it's, it's clean. So like I see why Paul said that this physical training is of some value because it does impact other areas. I'm paying more attention to what I'm eating now. Uh, and a lot of times that's a good thing because I'm paying attention. I'm like, hey, this is good for me. I'm doing better on that. And sometimes they're like, oh, this is a peanut butter cookie. And like, I'm more aware though, because I'm like, you shouldn't ha have that, right? I'm still, <laughs> I'm still fighting against the flesh, but I'm, I'm working on it. And, and I want you to know that this physical training is of some value and it, it, it accomplishes much over the course of our whole lives. But don't miss... What Paul is saying, he's saying it is of some value, but training in godliness is of much more value, that, that, that there's more there. He says that it has value for this life, right? That we're going to be more patient. We're going to be more kind. We're, we're going to um, have more wisdom. We're going to have a better perspective. We're going to have more peace in our soul whenever we are training for godliness, because as we become more godly, we get these fruits of the Spirit that begin to, to develop in us. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you want more of those things, what is it going to take to get it? It's going to take training in godliness, becoming more like Christ. And when we become more like Christ, the Spirit, the power that we have begins to change who we are from the inside out. Now, I love that it says that it's not only good in this life, but the, and also in what's to come, uh, because it's not just this old ancient moral code that we have to hate and you know kind of abide by and just suffer through so that one day we'll be able to rejoice in it. No, no, no. He says it has value, listen to me, for you, for me, for us today. Do you want more peace? 
Do you want more kindness? Do you want to live with a sense of hope? Do you want some stability in your spirit? If the answer is yes, then we've got to stop trying and we've got to start training. We've, we've got to make some of these investments. And yeah, when we get to heaven, there's going to be a payoff there too. It says, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Um, and that's super important. Why? Um, because it doesn't really matter uh, how much you train this body. You can nip it, tuck it, Botox it, diet cut it, curl it. You can do all kinds of stuff to your body, right? But at some point, you know what happens to all of our bodies? They decay. They wear out. They die. At some point, that's what happens. And so what he's saying is, yeah, that's of some value, but believer in Jesus, follower of Christ, your soul will live forever. That part of you that makes you you is going to live forever. And so what we do with our time on earth matters. How much faith we have matters. How obedient we are matters. Um, how much we seek the will of God prepares us and prepares our soul for heaven. It's the same argument that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 9 a, a little while ago. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training and they do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So here are these people that have been practicing by wrestling lions and uh, horses and bulls and uh, whatever else, and 10 months of um, pain and sacrifice and dedication to, to, to developing their, their, their sport, um, and they get a crown of leaves. That was the thing that they would get. It was a crown made of olive leaves and parsley. And I'm just telling you, like wrestling with a lion hardly seems worth it, to get a crown of olive leaves. Do you agree or disagree? Does that seem, I mean, I thought about it. I was like, unless they give you like a side of ranch or something. I don't know. Because I could see myself like, okay, this is, okay. Right? Because I haven't eaten anything in 10 months. I've been wrestling lines. So you've got to make the crown work. That's what they would get. We train as believers of Jesus and followers of Christ. We train to get a reward of a godly life that will never age. It will never wither. It will never decay. It will never diminish. It is eternal. That's what we are training for. And some of you, I'm sure at this point are thinking, well, I mean, this just feels like preacher semantics, Randy. Training versus trying. They both start with T. We know how you preachers like to do that. Is there really a difference between training uh, and trying? And I would, I would tell you, yes, there is. Because if somebody tells you, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to make that work, or hey, I'm going to try, do you think that they're really resolved to making it work? No. So often we use the phrase, I'll try to fill in the blank, so that we can end a conversation with somebody that we want to get out of. Y'all know I'm right. When we tell ourselves that we're going to try something, we know that by saying, I'm going to try, leaves us an exit. It gives us an off ramp. It gives us an excuse um, to, to get out. So trying is an attempt to change with minimal commitment. That's what trying is. It, it, there may be an attempt to change, but the commitment level is minimal at best. And it's a half-hearted attempt. I'm going to try to read my Bible. I'm going to try to stop surfing the web late at night. I'm going to try not to eat the whole thing. I'm going to try to go a month without alcohol. I'm going to try to pay off my credit card. I'm going to try. I'm going to try, 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 try. And we all know that most of the time when we try something, it fails. Because it's an attempt to change with minimal commitment. But training is a wholehearted commitment to achieve a specific result. There's a difference between trying and training. Let me give you some things that are just really, really practical. Uh, the first thing, if you're going to train, is you've got to get the gear, right? People that are serious about something get the gear that enables them to be better at their craft, at their hobby, whatever it is that they're doing. People who are serious about training get the gear. So um, runners, they, they buy, you know, hokas or whatever the, the lightest, most durable shoe is. Um, something to hold their, their phone. Uh, they make sure that they have uh, 
you know, some kind of AirPods or whatever else that are going to um, stay in their ears as they're running. They have a camelback for water because it's Texas and it's hot in the summer. Uh, they got those little shorts. That's why I'm never going to be a runner. I'm just telling you all. I, I, not that, and it's bad for my knees, I've decided. But, um, but really, it's the shorts. I just, I can't. And some of y'all, you pull that off, it's fine. I, no way. I mean, I would cause traffic problems. <laughs> and so anyway, it's, yeah, so I'm not ever going to be a runner. Uh, people who are serious about getting organized, they get themselves a good planner, different color markers, stickers, labels, binders, inserts. Uh, if you're getting serious about a sport, let's say baseball, uh, you're going to get really good cleats. You're going to get good bats. You're going to have uh, a good glove. Um, like I, I, I'm not an athlete. Uh, never have been. Don't plan to be. Uh, but I, so I've got, like, I like to mow my yard. Y'all can make fun of me if you want. I really like, so we don't have um, a yard of the month. But I feel like I win every month. <laughs> and if they ever decided to have one, I'd just be like, well, just get a sign stick in my yard. You can leave it there. It's fine. Because I, that's one of my goals. I want to have uh, a really clean yard. And I want the, y'all know you should edge, right? Like, you, y'all know. And whenever your shrubs are all like, ah, that, that they are crying out to be trimmed. And uh, whenever you mow, if, it, if it's not level, you, you, need, you need to fix that. Because some of us drive by and we're like, oh, uh, <laughs> And it, you can fix it. So, like, but that's something I enjoy doing. So I've got, I've got better gear over the course of time. And, and I've got some friends. They don't care anything about it. And that's fine. That's their business. Uh, but whenever you look at the gear I use versus the gear that they use, um, it makes sense why my yard's better. Uh, it's because I've made some investments in my gear. I really wanted to figure out a way to put my bad boy zero turn, three blade, 60 inch deck mower up here. I was just going to drive out here and he'll be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. Just showing off. That's all I'm doing. So like, I like that. That's good. Like I like that. So I've got the gear, um, to take care of my, my yard. What, what people are passionate about, they invest in. And so you've got to get the gear if you're going to be, um, training in certain things. The other thing is you've got to get a game plan. Uh, in order uh, to get better and to be successful. And so um, I've mentioned that I've gone, been going to the gym. This has been for several months now uh, to just get my heart rate up and to get the 120 minutes, um, 140 minutes, I don't know, it's math, uh, a, a bunch of minutes a week on a treadmill. And so I've been really consistent at that, but I've had some friends say, hey, you know, you can't like outwalk a bad diet and you really probably should be uh, lifting weights because then your muscles are doing something, I don't know, the rest of the day. And I, they're like, you really should, you really should, you really should. And so I politely say, you really should mind your own business. <laughs> like, you know, but they're trying to help me and I understand that. So a couple, like not last, not this past week, but the week before, um, I, I decided to, after I got done with the treadmill, uh, I decided I was going to get on one of the machines. And so I don't know how these machines work. And there's a bunch of them, and there's free weights, but that feels too dangerous. So I, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to use some of these machines. And there was one that was sitting there, and the, the little saddle part uh, was right here. And then there was this, this back part, because anything typically with like a seat and a back, you feel like you should sit in it this way, right? Have y'all ever sat in it? You're sitting in a chair right now. This is how you sit in a chair. This is how normal people sit in a chair, right? Well, so I sat on this machine, and it's, I think it's going to be better for you to, to illustrate if I, like this. So I sat on the machine, and I was like, okay, well, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to pull. So I turn around, and there's like a handle here and a handle here. So I got the handles, and I started doing this. Well, come to find out, that's not the right way to do it. Oh, y'all couldn't see that, could you? Here, let me, let me make it. This is important for y'all to see. It's like, so I'm doing this right here. And a guy that I, I think maybe had been uh, born in the gym came over. <laughs> because when somebody can refer to me as little buddy. <laughs> so he comes over, he's like, hey, uh, hey little buddy. <laughs> and I said, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. He said, you got you to turn. He said, this isn't for your back, it's for your chest. And I was like, well, they should label that. And he pointed... <laughs> He pointed at this picture <laughs> that's literally on the, device, the machine. And he's like, okay, so you just lean forward, and then you pull this way. I went, oh, that feels better. Yeah, <laughs> that feels, <laughs> that's better. So anyway, I'm trying, trying to go to the gym more. Um, 
So after that debacle, I just stayed on that machine <laughs> for a week because I thought, I, I can't risk it. I really can't. And then some of the other pictures, I was like, I don't even understand how you get on a machine like that. The, it's all contorted, legs are braced, and you know, there's stuff. And I was like, I, I don't, I'm just going to stick with what I know. And what I know is that one machine. And then so this past, I think it was Tuesday, I, I walk into the gym, and a trainer from the Kaufman campus had been in there uh, working with a client. And I walked in, I was just kind of looking at the one that I know how to do and hoping, I was kind of scanning to see if there's anybody else in there that I knew um, because I thought, well, maybe I'll try a different machine if there's literally no one in here that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and as I'm scanning and looking and praying and debating and thinking about leaving because I thought, eh, uh, she said, hey, Randy, do you need, do you want me? Would you like help? Would you like some help? And I said, uh, Sure. Sure, I would, I, yeah, I think so, I would like that. And um, she said, well, this machine, I said, oh, I learned how to do that one. <laughs> got, got that. <laughs> and she said, well, this one, that one, and that one, they all kind of go together to work, and she started saying lots of muscles, and I was like, okay. Uh, she said, well, what are your goals? And I said, well, w- <laughs> just I, all the, who <laughs> told me I should do this? I don't know. I, and then there's like, she said, well, this one, this one, this one, I'll do this, that one, that one, and that one, do your back, and this one, this one. She said, don't forget your legs, don't forget leg day. And I said, these legs have been carrying around a lot of weight for a long time. <laughs> Pretty sure the legs are good. The legs are good. Getting out of bed is a workout. Ugh, there we are, feel the burn. So we're good, right? So she shows me these machines. And I, I started going through them. And this is part of the reason why today, if you saw me worshiping, I'm like T-Rex worship today. Because <laughs> my arms, hold on. Right there. That's it. That's it. There, whatever we did here, it's, it's, it need not ever happen again. Like, because I don't have full range of motion. Whenever she finished helping me, uh, she said, I'm really, really proud of you for being up here and, and doing this. And um, she hears my sermon. She knows my struggle. And I thought what she said at the end of it was so appropriate because um, she said, now, you know what some of these machines do, but whenever I ask you what you were really wanting to accomplish, and she said, I just want to encourage you, you need a plan. Like you really need a plan. And she said, I'm willing to help you develop that or you can go online. There's lots of experts, lots of whatever. There's lots of opinions that, but there's, there's no shortage. You just need to get a plan. And that was so helpful to me. Physical training is of some value. But spiritual training, godliness, training in godliness is of eternal um, value. And so we've got to make sure that we are, are, are training in godliness. And so we've got to, first of all, we've got to get the gear. And I wanted to show you some of my gear today um, whenever it comes to training in godliness. Uh, first of all, um, I'm not a journaler. There are some people who journal, and they make it sound like um, if you don't journal, you don't know or love Jesus. Uh, but that's not true. I lost, I lost my good pen. Okay, I'm freaking out a little bit, but we're good. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't journal. Uh, I've tried. My kids will find several journals where I went for like three days, skipped a week, journaled for two days, and then never touched it again. Uh, they'll find like 10 of those. And eventually I just said, okay, oh, there's my pen. Um, I said, I give up on that. And so I've found this, this Bible, and this one's actually fairly new, uh, but the way I, I do it is as I'm reading, um, I have a complete blank page over here to the side. And then as I'm reading, I can circle words, draw arrows. I can ask myself questions. I can write down a thought that I believe God has given me. Um, as he reveals truth, I can capture it here. Uh, and this is good for me in my personal spiritual development. Uh, but this is part of my gear. You will almost never, probably ever, see me preach from this Bible. Uh, but if I'm leading a Bible study or you catch me, uh, you probably won't because I, I study in private. But if you were to, to walk in on me studying, this would be the Bible that I'm using for that because I'm able uh, to capture thoughts all in one place. A uh, little side benefit, I think this is going to be a really cool thing for my kids um, or grandkids or whoever winds up with it uh, whenever I'm gone. And so uh, this is important to me. It's part of my gear. 
Also, there's a little thing in here that holds my pen. Uh, I like to have a heavy pen that writes consistently well. Have y'all ever tried to start writing something and you have a junky pen uh, and then you're scouring drawers and everything else looking for a pen that'll work and then you're like, oh, it's not that important. Uh, So I keep a good pen. Uh, And then I also have, um, after I read the text multiple times, I had a seminary professor say read the text 30 to 40 times before you go to a commentary. Um, So I try to read the text over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, But then I use study guides and commentaries to help me uh, see things maybe I didn't see on my own or to answer questions that I wasn't able uh, to, to figure out on my own connect dots. I've got a book that I'm reading. I usually have a book that I'm reading just um, for fun that's to edify me, sharpen me, help me. Uh, and so the one I'm in now is called Gospel by J.D. Greer. Um, great book. Uh, so I, I want you to get gear. Do you ha- this thing is kind of annoying, but it wraps around the Bible. So uh, do you have gear? Do you have tools that are in place? Again, the things that we're super excited about, uh, we get gear for. Um, Men who love to hunt, you have a leash, you have a deer sand, you have the ammo, you have the camo, you've got um, the the feeders, you've got, you spray yourself with deer urine. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, right? If some of y'all didn't know that happens, it happens. And so like whenever you're really invested, you ladies, you have like a, a girl's weekend or whatever else, uh, you plan it out. You, you plan where you're going to go. You get your Airbnb booked. You decide what day you're going to wear what kind of hat. We're going to have trucker's hats on the plane. And then on Friday, we're going to have the Stetsons. And then on Sunday, we'll have the beach hats. And then, you know, we're going to do the fedora at the pool or whatever. Like you're, you know, like you have a plan. You've got the gear and you're ready um, to roll. And so get the gear. And you're like, I don't even know where to start. Download the YouVersion Bible app uh, and find a study that you can start to go through. Um, but you, you've got you've to get the gear and get yourself positioned for that. You also have to have a game plan, like we've already talked about, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. What's Paul saying? He's saying, I am not showing up without a plan. I, I, I've got the gear and, and I've got the plan. I'm, I'm going to... to create some games. I'm going to allow the Spirit of God. I'm going to beg, plead with the Spirit of God that I am open for you to do something in me that I cannot do on my own. But what I can do is I can show up with a plan, ready to receive whatever it is you have for me. Like, I want to be ready for that. So you got to get the gear, and you have to have a plan. And so uh, for me, that's daily time with God. Sometimes it lasts 10 minutes. Sometimes it's 30 minutes plus. Uh, I meet most Mondays um, for breakfast at uh, Nina's, if you ever want to come spy on me, uh, and I meet with Don Griffin, who's um, older than me, he's further along in life, and he helps me, he mentors me as a dad, as um, a husband, as a church leader, as a disciple of Jesus, he invests in me and he pours um, into me. And so um, I buy breakfast and then he pours into me. Uh, on Wednesdays, I meet with somebody who grew up in my youth ministry, he's obviously younger than I am, uh, but I, I look up to him spiritually and he edifies me. He corrects me. He speaks life into me, and I, I enjoy that. That's Wednesday mornings at 6 o'clock. If you want to be a spy on me on that, we're at Denny's and Kaufman. Uh, it revolves around food, working on that, but it's there, right? Uh, I, I have a Bible study on um, Monday mornings at 6 o'clock, and then I also am in a community group. I, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just telling you, like, I've got a plan. There are things that, I, like, are non-negotiables, and the reason they're not a they're non-negotiable is because I want to train in godliness because I believe it has value today and it has value for all of eternity. So we need to get in the word. And I, I just want to um, kind of pause for a second and then I'm going to land the plane and we're going to get you out of here. Uh, but just as, as one of your pastors, can I, can I just say something that I think needs to be said? And you may be like, well, you're really not my favorite, so I'm not listening. You don't have to. It's fine. The rest of them would tell you the same thing. I think we've come to the end of followers of Jesus just trying. I think we're going to have to start training. And what does that mean? I, I have concern that we have a lot of, everybody look at me, Christians who have never broken a sweat in their pursuit of Jesus. I have no idea what the scripture says. The only way we know what the scripture says for for a lot of people is um, sound bites and memes, social media posts, a song they heard on KLTY. 
or 90.9 or whatever it is. And as your pastor, one of your pastors, I just want to implore you, we need to be training. We need to get in the word of God so that the word of God will get into us. And when we do that, it's gonna change the way we view the world. It's gonna be bring peace to places that feel really chaotic. It's gonna give us vision for where we're headed. It's gonna give us the tools we need, the words to say in the moments when we need those tools and those words. But we have to stop trying and we have to shift our mindset by the grace of God, the power of God that is already in us as followers of Jesus to say, I'm gonna stop giving myself an escape route. I'm going to be diligent in the study of God's word. I'm going to be a person that is um, committed to prayer. I'm gonna do the hard work of training. Now, the last little bit of that, uh, and I thought this was an interesting way to illustrate it, Uh, I've got a friend, he's a friend to our church, professional bull rider, um, who made a lot of money riding bulls. And I don't know the exact amounts, but let's just, let's just say, and he, cause he may be watching and if I get the number wrong, forgive me. But like in one, one ride, you know, make $150,000. And it would be easy for somebody to say, and I've heard people say this, well, it must be nice. Make $150,000 in eight seconds. But what any good coach would tell you, he didn't make $150,000 in eight seconds. His winning happened when he was training. So you wanna walk in victory? You wanna win? We have to stop trying. And we have to start training. I'm gonna pray and we'll be dismissed. Our prayer partners will be here at the front to receive you. We had many that came the first hour. I would suspect that there are some who will come today just to have someone pray over you, uh, whatever the need is. And we have prayer partners online as well who would love to pray for you so that we can move out of this mindset of uh, trying and we can move into a mindset by God's grace and through his power to train for a victorious life. So God help us. We submit to you. Uh, We're going to stop trying and making up excuses, and we're going to start training because you have given us your spirit. We have the power. You've given us your word. We have the direction and the authority. So we're praying today you give us the discipline to train so that we might win for your glory and our good, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.